It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. Do you know that's the 200th time we've said this? That is, yeah, that is 200, amazing. 200th episode today. And not to no. sound surprised or anything like this, well, but, but we, but are, we kind of are. Because when we started this, we thought, okay, a program on the book of Revelation would be great. We can This will cover maybe a year that we can mm-hmm. move on to something else. And here we are at the end of four years now, going into five, our fifth year. And we're still not all the way through. We're only up to Revelation chapter 17. I know. Well, you and I have been doing Gilbert House Fellowship for going on 10 years. And because of that, we have learned a lot of things about the Bible's interconnectivity Mm. and the divine counsel concept. Thank you, Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, We miss you, by the way. The late Doc, uh, Mike Heiser, boy, we learned a lot from him. And we continue to learn from his work. And because of that... We went to back to Genesis right. before we even dug into the book of Revelation. And we've had to go through a lot of Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah and so many prophecies and then extra yeah. biblical books that help give us context. Right, like the book of First Enoch, as mm-hmm. we discovered, which is uh, uh, kind of a surprise for many folks who are not even really aware of what the book of Enoch is. And when we say the book of mm-hmm. Enoch, we're usually referring to the book of First Enoch. There are actually three books of Enoch. Mm-hmm. Second and third were written in the Christian era, so not really relevant for Christian theology. But um, the book of First Enoch completed just about the time of the birth of Jesus. And uh, as we've learned over the last year, there are concepts and teachings that are relevant to the Bible and to mainstream Christian theology, not just the weird fringy stuff Mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the giants of Genesis chapter 6. We're talking about, for example, uh, most notably, the use of the term, the title, the Son of Man by Jesus, which didn't appear in any Jewish writing in that way prior to the end of the first century BC in the book of First Enoch. You know, it's so exciting to unpack that book of First Enoch and discover those parables which come later on in the book that, as you say, were written shortly before completed, shortly mm-hmm. before the Son of Man appeared on the scene. John the Baptist may have studied with these uh, Essenes who were living in the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Right, right. Uh, in the vicinity of uh, Capernaum, where Jesus based his ministry, in the vicinity of Bethsaida, where the first three disciples were called. Mm-hmm. And when you look at a map, and I'll, I'll put this up on the screen here, an overlay of these megalithic funerary monuments called dolmens, um, most of them are clustered in that region just to the north of there, mm-hmm. just north of Chorazin, which Jesus condemned along with Capernaum. Yes. Uh, Strangely and, enough, if you didn't know that, look it up. Yeah, and uh, that, that valley through which the Jordan River flows north of the Sea of Galilee, surrounded by these dolmens on both sides, the mm-hmm. mountains of Naphtali on the west, the Golan Heights on the east. It's uh, really astonishing when you see that this this confluence of events, the fact that this group of Essenes had been led to settle in the first century BC uh, at Magdala, mm-hmm. near where Mary Magdalene, uh, well, where, where she was from, hence mm-hmm. the name Magdalene. They, they lived in caves on Mount Arvel. Right. It, it's this almost a 45, it's like a square, a corner. It is yeah. so flat on top and then just goes straight down. And, and this is really new research, by the way, this, this discovery of the Essenes who lived near the Sea of Galilee uh, and their authorship of this section of the book of First Enoch, chapters 37 to 71, called the Book of Parables, their dwelling place in the cave village of Mount Arvel, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, overlooking the village of Capernaum, mm-hmm. over, from which they can see Mount Hermon in the distance. 
And the fact that they were led to write those chapters, according to scholars, there and at that time exactly. is not coincidental. It that's is one not. of the most I think that's one of the most astonishing things we've discovered in the over the last two hundred episodes is that the silent centuries between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew mm-hmm. in the, the Bible, so-called, so-called silent. silent centuries, really weren't silent after all. No, not at all. There was a lot of prophetic writing. There was a lot of study going on. Believe it or not, the disciples read books. <laughs> Dr. Michael Heiser reminded us of that many, many times. So they understood how to, the, the signs to look for, right. for the Son of Man, because they grew up in that area. Mm-hmm. They knew these these hermits who lived in the caves, and they had heard their teaching and their preaching. Right. They were preaching that the Son of Man was about to come on the right. scene. Now, the phrase may sound familiar to you. If you read the book of Daniel, you know that in Daniel chapter 7, he has a vision of the throne room of God, and at the right hand of the Ancient of Days is one like a son of man. And that is, in all probability, that's where these Essenes who wrote First Enoch and the Book of Parables got that title. But the difference between his depiction in the Book of Daniel and the way he's described in the Book of Parables, again, that's chapters 37 to 71 of the Book of First Enoch, is that in Daniel, he really doesn't do anything. He um, is given a kingdom, mm-hmm. a kingdom that's everlasting, dominion that will never end, but in the book of First Enoch, he is described as the agent of God's judgment. He is the one who returns to earth to punish not just wicked kings and evil landowners, but the rebellious angels. Yes. In fact, Azazel or Azael is mentioned specifically in the book of parables as the leader of this group of angels who taught humanity things we weren't supposed mm-hmm. to know. Yes. And that is a radical change from from what had come before in Jewish religious thought. But e- even more than that, and this is something that John uh, the Baptist, that is, taught that was a really radical departure. There, there was a fundamental split, and this is something I've been doing some study on for a presentation I recently gave in mm-hmm. uh, Ohio. Um, there was a fundamental split between Jewish religious scholars in the centuries leading up to the birth of Jesus. On the one hand, you had the priesthood in Jerusalem who believed that it was their responsibility to contain the evils of the world through their faithful performance of the, the rites and rituals and the feasts. So they, they were called, scholars are now referring to them as the Zadokite priesthood for Zadok the high priest mm-hmm. in, the, in the time of David. But after the return from the Babylonian captivity, there was another group that was convinced that the earth had been so contaminated by the sin of those rebellious angels, Azael, and Shemayaza mm-hmm. and the others, that only direct intervention by God could make things right again. And these are the groups scholars now call Enochians, those who believed in what was mm-hmm. in the book of Enoch, the first section, the book of Watchers, describing the sin of those fallen angels. And then the second section, which again was written in the final century before the birth of Jesus, uh, describing who would come mm-hmm. back. You, you're I, discussing as the Essenes. And yes, that, that group that... But, but they're not one big block. No, no, and I'm, I'm getting to that. Okay. Because this group, so you had this this split, the Jerusalem, the Zadokite priesthood, then you had the Anakians. But then among the Anakians, there was a split where uh, one group who eventually were called the Essenes, um, th- and this occurred around the time of 60 BC where there was a, um, a, a or 160 BC rather, uh, a, a, a descendant of the, the the uh, original um, Hasmonean ruler, oh yes, Ju- uh-huh. Judas Maccabee, actually yes. his brother Jonathan, uh, around the year 152 BC, mm-hmm. he was offered a deal by a Greek ruler by the name of Alexander Ballas, who was. This gets into the politics. The sec- couple centuries before the birth of Jesus was really, really turbulent in Judea. And I know um, you can't really explain it yeah. in depth. But well, what, what it boiled down to was this. Jonathan was offered the, a, the high priesthood, which he was not entitled to because he was not from a priest right, or family. Right, he wasn't a Levite. Right, he was a king, but he became the high priest. So a group that had been following the leader of this Anakian community, who's called the teacher of righteousness in, the, in uh, some of the... Uh, the, the, the documents found at Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm-hmm. um, 
It's believed that he was the high priest between the years 159 and 152. But when you look at the official list of high priests in Jerusalem, there's a gap. Oh, there's a gap oh. between 159 and 152. Apparently, he and Jonathan Maccabee had a split, a rather violent split, because the teacher of righteousness had to flee to Damascus and take his followers. Oh. Yeah. But some of his followers stayed and aligned themselves with Jonathan, and they became the Pharisees. Oh, So you boy. had the Anakians split. Now you get the Pharisees here, and you've got the other group called the Essenes in Damascus. And that name actually comes from the Hebrew word um, Hasidim, meaning the pious ones. It's Hasidic But we Jews. always associate the, the Essenes with Qumran. Right, right. But that is changing within the last 10 years or so, as scholars have realized, now wait a minute, around the year 100 BC, there was another split amongst the Hasidim, mm -hmm. which in Aramaic is Hasin, and Essenes. the Greeks get the Essenes from that. So th now these are not Hasidic Jews, but it's the same word. It means the pious ones. Mm -hmm. So the pious ones, the Essenes in Damascus decided, okay, look, we need to move back to Judea. One group who still followed the teachings of the teacher of righteousness who had passed away by this time, they settled at Qumran. And they were okay. very, very religious, very ritualistic. And it was men only. Men only. You had to follow our rules. There was like a three-year period of, um, uh, of uh, apprenticeship mm -hmm. almost before you would be allowed in to become part of the community. The other group that was a little less um, separatist, willing to settle in... And, and be part of the community in which they live. Raise families. Raise families. They settled near the Sea of Galilee at Magdala. And that was the group that eventually produced the, uh, the Book of Parables. And some so of them were hermits living in those caves. Hermits living in the caves. Because I can't picture a family living in the caves. So, and again, you had the, the, all of this turmoil taking place. You had uh, uh, in, in around uh, 60 BC, the, the Roman general Pompey the Great during the Civil War came in. And uh, at first the Romans were seen as the, the, uh, the, the saviors, the righteous ones. And then the Romans imposed a, a land settlement that shrank Judea to a third of its size. And so the Romans were evil. And then the Parthians came in around 40 BC. Herod the Great fled to Rome. On the recommendation of Mark Antony of Antony and Cleopatra fame, Herod was declared a friend of Rome and the king of Judea. So he came back with a Roman army, kicked the Parthians out. He was backed by the Essenes in this war. Which ones? Herod kicking out the Parthians. All, Which all, of, the, all of the Essenes. Oh, all of them? Even right. the ones that, the little hermits? Yeah. Yes. In fact, there's some evidence that Herod camped just outside their little cave village. Hold on. They were expecting the Son of Man. Right. And they were expecting the Son of Man to return based on the prophecy in Daniel. Oh, yes. 77s. They yes. were expecting it 490 years after the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. So mm -hmm. somewhere around 80 or 90 BC, they were expecting the Son of Man to return. But their math was he, off. He didn't. They thought, okay, maybe the math is off. So when the Romans showed up, it's like, hey, maybe it's the Romans. No, it's not the Romans. And then when Herod came along, it's like, hey, maybe it's Herod. And then after he won at the siege of Jerusalem, 37 BC, and Herod became the king, it became, Herod actually granted to the Essenes a quarter of the city of Jerusalem, the Essene quarter in Jerusalem, because they backed him in his rebellion. But it became pretty clear that Herod was a bad dude. And so they realized, okay, he's not the Messiah either. And that is when the Essenes near the Sea of Galilee realizing, okay, we still believe that the Son of Man is returning, that God is sending a Messiah to deliver us from this evil. It's not Herod, but don't fear, he's still coming. And that was what produced the book of parables. So it's understanding the history of that period, you know, you had the split and then another split and then another split, and then Herod disappointed them. This book came out just about the time Herod died, the birth of Jesus and John the Baptist, and it came out and was produced in an area right where John was preaching and Jesus based his ministry. Wow. That's, that's one of the most astonishing things we've discovered over the last 200 episodes. Let's talk a little bit more about that and then bring in the next part in the book of Revelation, yes. which is going to take several episodes, but we'll be right back. Everyone learns differently, and that's why we write fiction. It is. I find that some people love to read nonfiction, but there's something about fiction that psychologists say breaks that fourth wall. You no longer doubt what you're reading. You get so engrossed in the story that you learn. 
You can learn propaganda or you can learn God's truth. Absolutely. So, yes, we write nonfiction books, but we are also using the gift of storytelling to try to teach spiritual warfare and spiritual truths. And during the months of August and September, we're offering all 10 of our novels at 20% off. All 10 at 20% off? That's crazy. That's that is right. a really, really a good deal. And now's the time if you want to buy gifts for birthdays or Christmas or whatever uh, gift giving season it is. It could even be Mother's Day next year. This is the time to save 20% on all of our fiction. And Derek's fiction is really, really good if you've never well, read it. And Sharon's Red Wing Saga. Eight novels so far. She's hard at work on number nine. nine? If you want to get engrossed in characters who are really grappling with the supernatural and trying to make sense of that world while teaching the divine council concepts that mm -hmm. we try to communicate here, get involved in the Red Wing saga. Again, all eight of those novels, plus my two novels, The God Conspiracy and Iron Dragons, 20% off now only at our online store. That's gilberthouse.org slash store. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. And again, 200 episodes. Thank you. Thank you for watching and for helping us and out. thank with you, Lord. With Build a Barn Better. Oh. You've been helping out with that so much. We're able to get the, the floor is in now. Yes, I'll show you some video of the uh, the crew in action. God bless the team. And we're going to give them, give you their names. Uh, Ozark's Concrete Coatings out mm -hmm. of Springfield came and did a wonderful job. They but really again, did. it was made possible by your generosity. Thank this you. This floor that's down is, you know, it's a 15 year guarantee. So our, our office chairs are not going to harm that floor. I mean, it's made that you can park trucks on it. So It's amazing. Yeah. So by the time you're watching this, the electric may be in the process of being uh, upgraded so we can put in the HVAC system mm -hmm. and we'll get the insulation in. So we're hoping that by the middle of August, maybe end of August, we will be moving equipment into the building. And it's all because of you. Thank you. And we thank you for your support. You can find a place at our website, gilberthouse.org slash donate, unravelingrevelation.tv slash donate. Thank you. Thank you for your support. And uh, we're looking forward to... Uh, seeing what the Lord has in store for the barn. Yes, and be sure to download our app. We've now got a conversation place in there. So go download the app, Gilbert House, and it's all of the places where you go get an app. Mm. Yeah, uh, iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle Fire, uh, phones and tablets, all of our content is there. But also, as Sharon said, there's a, a messaging center where we can have conversations with one another off the internet yeah. and away from social media and the algorithms that might trigger a bot to spike a conversation. We may not so. always be on this Mars Hill place where you watch some of you watches called YouTube. <laughs> but if that day comes, yeah. have the app ready. Well, you were talking about the Essenes who were living up in what, what you and I refer to as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And it's right. that big region where all those dolmens are. Mm -hmm. And it is north of the Sea of Galilee. And it goes all the way north to Mount Hermon. Yeah, that's one. Uh, that's another amazing thing about the book of First Enoch, and and not just the book of parables, but that first section, the first thirty six chapters, which are called the Book of Watchers. The geographic clues in the book of First Enoch all point to the Upper Galilee and Mount Hermon and Bashan as a region of uh, s supernatural importance. And we visited a couple of sites. Of course, we've been to the foothills of Mount Hermon. Mm -hmm. uh, we've visited Caesarea Philippi or Banyas now, the Grotto of Pan, mm -hmm. several times and had the opportunity to share that uh, scripture where Jesus mm -hmm. asks his followers, who do you say that I am? But having gone there previous years, I, I forgot the first question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do people say the Son of Man is? To ask that question right there is so important. And if you don't understand the context, you won't really understand the importance of what the Lord asked. That's why we dig into not just the Bible as a whole, but also into extra biblical books that were written at the time mm -hmm. so we can understand what the disciples understood. Right, right. And... and <laughs> This is a thing that, that really surprises folks. And this is why we recommend the books by Dr. Michael Heiser, the companion to the Book of Enoch. He's got two volumes out. The first mm -hmm. one deals with the Book of Watchers, and the second one deals with the Book of Parables and shows there and in his book, Reversing Hermon, how influential the Book of First Enoch is on Christian New Testament theology. And again, it's not just mm -hmm. the weird Genesis 6, Giants, Nephilim portion, but John's teaching 
of repentance, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. This was radical and it was new. I mean, to the Zadokite priesthood in Jerusalem, this would have been anathema. No, 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 no. Forgiveness only comes through the faithful performance of the rituals. To the Enochians, both at, uh, well, at Qumran especially, you were only forgiven if you separated from the public because the, the great unwashed masses, mm-hmm. masses are, are sinners and they're sinful. You've got to separate from them and come live in our community and follow all of our rules. This idea that the public, that the, the hoi polloi could somehow repent and be forgiven, that was anathema to the Essenes as mm-hmm. well. So here comes John with this baptism of repentance. If you repent of your sins, you will be forgiven. The only place that is found in any Jewish writing prior to the, the, the ministry of John is in 1st Enoch chapter 50 verses 1 through 4 which again was written in the last quarter of the first century BC sometime between 25 BC and the birth of Jesus mm-hmm. was just th- in time for just Jesus in to time be- that's the only place in any Jewish writing by which we mean the Old Testament mm. prior to the arrival of John and his ministry this was new this was radical and in that first First Enoch 50, it describes the return of this chosen one, the anointed one, the son of man. And in that day, basically at the final judgment, God would bless those who had repented and the others would see this and have a chance to repent. John essentially was preaching to the others, to the Enochians, the, the, the Essenes, and to the Zadokite priesthood. No, no, there is no forgiveness outside of our rituals and our rules. Uh-huh. John was saying, no, no. God will bless those who've been faithful to him, but the others will see this and have a chance to repent and God will forgive them. That was radical. That That, was new. That was really radical. And to be baptized and to have Jesus come in and demonstrate this is what you should be doing. Yeah. Yes. That was remarkable. For Jesus to endorse that and then to apply that term to himself. I I did a search through uh, the Logos Bible software, which is a a powerful tool. It it can be a little pricey, but we use it every day, so we're really getting our money's worth out of it. When you search for that term, the Son of Man, capital S, capital M, Son of Man as a title, you find it 83 times in the New Testament, 78 times it's in the red letters, which means Jesus Jesus is speaking it, and he's applying it to himself. And again, it's in the context of, the Son of Man returning, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Uh Also, as it was, likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. That's a different context for that term than we see in Daniel chapter 7. Now, you may be sitting there asking yourself, how does any of this relate to where we're going next in the book of Revelation? It is because after the Babel event where the Lord did come down and he judged the entire earth, he had previously judged the entire earth through a flood. Now he judged them by dividing their languages Mm -hmm. and he assigned an entire group of angels. We don't know what sort of class they were. Mm -hmm. These were Elohim, creatures that served him in heaven that he sent down to shepherd these various language groups. Mm -hmm. One of those, I believe, was an entity that we sometimes call Inanna. I agree. I agree. She has caused more chaos in human history than almost any of the others. She and, and, and one or two helpers. But... The reason I'm saying that this all connects to the Essenes is because, as in we see, as we see in Heiser's book *Reversing Hermon*, that event is connected to the post-flood angels' rebellion. They I, came down, and I think God said, "Be good." They did. They weren't. No, they no. accepted worship. And in fact, when you you read some of the early church fathers, and I am by no means an expert on the patristic studies, the early church theologians, but I've read enough of what they wrote about demonology to understand that it was the consensus until the time of Augustine in the early fifth century mm-hmm. A.D. that they knew that angels had come down, uh, and that's a broad term. It's really too generic, but. Uh, angels came down and 
had been tasked with supervising God's creation and had given in to temptation, both uh, before the flood by sinning with, with um, humans, but also after the flood in terms of the administration, setting themselves up as gods. Mm. And that's what we're discussing here. You've got the pre-flood group who, according to Peter and Jude, are in chains in gloomy darkness. Peter specifically puts them in Tartarus. And then the group that came after mm-hmm. the Babel event. You've also got the spirits of the hybrid children yes. from the pre-flood event. Right. They are called demons today. Mm-hmm. So demons probably co- uh, connect and communicate with their daddies. Mm-hmm. Daddies maybe telepathically, I don't really know. Maybe demons get to go down and visit them in prison. Mm-hmm. But somehow they are, they're doing the, they're like minions. They do the will of their daddies. Yeah. In most cases. It, Some of them may do their own will. I it, don't know. It, it's like in prison where you get the messages being smuggled out from between the bars or something, the mob boss. Here's, here's behind, a little yeah. file that I baked into a cave. Right, right. Things like that. But uh, you've also got these post babble angels right. that were that came down and one of them, as I said earlier, probably called Inanna. Now, when it comes to judgment over these angels, you have general and specific. Mm-hmm. General, the pre-flood were all sent down to Tartarus, but there are a few who have specific judgments. One of them is probably an entity that you wrote a book about. Well, Shemiyaza, yeah, who I yes. believe is uh, the entity who in Revelation 9 is called the destroyer, Abaddon or mm-hmm. Apollyon, and he's been known by many names in between, such as Saturn, Kronos, um, Dagon, Molech, El, Enlil, etc., mm-hmm. etc., and he will have a brief period to torment humanity, which coincides with the number of months that Noah's Ark was on the water back in Genesis uh, chapters uh, 7 and 8. So uh, I think that's a clue in Scripture Mm -hmm. that we're dealing with the same entity here. The leader of the rebellion here had five months to watch his hybrid children destroyed in the flood, get five months at the end of time to destroy those without the seal of God in the 150 days. And we've always thought, why 150 days? Well, another entity is Satan. Satan. But also the whore of Babylon. Right. They are, in a sense, the unholy trinity of the end times. They are indeed. Well, we'll have to unpack Inanna in the next program, but we just want you to know that she is still building her kingdom. Yes. And we'll explain exactly what the aspects of that kingdom are and why the Lord has singled her out for specific judgment along with the others of this holy trinity. Yeah. Unholy trinity. Yeah, infernal trinity. Yes. Yeah, it's... um, it's really astonishing, and I know it's not what we've been taught. We sort of assume it's Satan and some minions, but there are other entities in the spirit realm, mm-hmm. and we know from Jude and Peter that there are angels who've sinned. Paul refers to them in Colossians. Women should wear something on their heads because of the angels. So there are other entities out there who are uh, assisting, who are co-conspirators in this rebellion against God, and we'll talk about them more next week on Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at unravelingrevelation.tv and gilberthouse.org. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri, 65633.